And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of the Maximum Apocalypse RPG, and soon and soon to be the creator of the Cyberpunk RPG Beta Red, the one and only R. Scott Ulz. I'm hoping I got that last name right. It's been a while. How are uh, you? It's Yules. 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 Hey, what's up? Yeah. Yules. I just I just have to remember it's like it's like that it's, it's like that annoying log that I have to deal with every Christmas time. Yeah, that that one log. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so it's. It's certainly been a hot minute since I've since I've had you in the hallowed grounds. How have you been holding up? Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Uh, things are pretty good over on my end. I still have to work my day job, so like nothing really changed there with mm -hmm. like everything going on. Uh, but my wife has started a business, and I have incorporated my own works on like game stuff into a business. So pretty good on my end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, aside, aside from aside from the fact that certain that certain folk. Um, have no have no have no perspective when it comes to weather. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, aside from that, yeah, uh, you know where people think it's cold when it's actually considered temperate, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And for well, I um, I'll always I'll always remember the one the one time I was the one time I was in um. Atlanta during during this freak during this freak storm where there was where they were or even they were getting snow, and everybody's panicking and and acting like and acting like the end of the world is coming. I'm just going, it's an inch, it's a fucking inch. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing happened here uh, in Portland a couple of years back, about three or four years ago, where they had this freak snowstorm. It was basically like. They were saying, hey, guys, it might snow. We're not sure, but it might snow. And then it did snow, and it snowed like four inches. And like mm -hmm. that's a, a decent amount, but um, not that much. But it shut down the city for four days. I can understand why city. it shut down the city, because they probably don't have the amount of plows that you'd need. There's probably like one or two plows for entire areas of the city. Yeah, I guess that's what they said. But then they also, like some of the other counties... So the city of Portland is actually made up of, of three counties. Mm -hmm. And two of the counties have a whole lot of rural space in them. And in theory, had the necessary plows to do the work. But apparently not. So, not entirely sure. It is what... Oh, well, it, 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 it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um when it but when it comes to when it comes to the set So I'll start off with the with the early parts. Now give give me the um skin the skinny about what you're planning with um, beta red cuz obviously there's no shortage of cyberpunk games especially these days. <laughs> um <laughs> But I'm. But yeah. what ex what exactly are you bring are you bringing to the table when it comes to your plans with this one? Yeah. Right. So the question is like, why make a cyberpunk game when you've got a bunch and like you have two major names that are all about the news these days, especially the gaming news. One in particular that's basically on every social media sphere, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that being cyberpunk itself. Why bring something to the table? Well, the answer is because there, for me, I, I have this one problem with the way that a lot of cyberpunk games are presented, and that is that there's this expectation that a cyberpunk-related game is going to be rules-heavy and like really complex and have a lot of different moving parts to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think that that's how all cyberpunk-related games should be. Um, just because... like. In its at its core, cyberpunk is just a literary genre, right? It's basically yes. just an extension of sci-fi. And, and and so I f I feel like um, the the trend, you know, the the rules light kind of trend should also apply here. But for some reason, the general idea is that oh, it's cyberpunk; it's going to be really heavy. And we're the funny the funny rules. thing is 
the funny thing is about that, and it's funny you mentioned the whole the whole rules light question, is because yeah, there have there have been two there there's been there's been a few attempt there's been a few attempts to go to go mm -hmm. a little more rule to go a little more rules light. Some of them, it's some of them using powered by some of them using say powered by the apocalypse, which I've got nothing I've got nothing against that particular system, but I think that's swinging the pendulum too far the other way. Correct. Um, and then I remember um, a few a few years ago I covered a um, I guess a simpler version of Shadowrun that that um, that had come out called Shadowrun Anarchy. Um, yep, I remember that too. And the idea was to convert um, at the time it was Shadowrun Fifth Edition, Sixth Edition wouldn't come out for another year to right. the Q system that Catalyst also had under the, their library. It, mm -hmm. Which is also used by Valiant Universe and Cosmic Patrol, yep. and some people cried foul on it, and I had the gall to actually try and play devil's advocate with it, and I sa basically said, "Look, Shadowrun is v is very crunchy, yes, but that doesn't mean every Cyberpunk game has to be." And I tried to I tried to approach it as if it was the basic. Like like how back in the day D and D had basic and advanced. That's kind of the paradigm yep. I was going for, and then mm -hmm. sixth edition came along and caused a whole other set of controversies. Which yep, a bunch of clerf, another kerfluffle. Yeah, I um the term that the term that I end up using about that kind of thing is scub. It, yeah. It's a very scub. Now, I didn't mind, um, Cyberpunk sixth edition. It. Felt like it was. It felt like it was dipping into some of the um, more high action stuff you would see in, say, Feng Shui, which yeah, right. When you when you consider the abilities of a lot of characters in Cyberpunk, whether it be whether it be the superhuman street samurai or the or the adept who supposedly who is able to do the kind of wire work that you'd see in a um, Shaw Brothers movie without the wires, um. Kind of, it kind of clashes with the crunchy nature, which is a problem yeah. that I, a, a problem that I've had with a lot of a lot of cyberpunk. You, it's a vi cyberpunk is a very empowering genre when it comes to gameplay, but when right. it comes to the actual mechanics, it wants to it wants to try and emphasize a realism that doesn't quite match. Correct. And that is absolutely correct. And when I when. And of co of course, whenever when I understand that streamlining has become a dirty word, but I do but I do think that just because you're trying to make things simpler does not mean you're going full story game, which is a criticism yeah, I see a lot. And yes, I get from what I saw of it. Would it be fair of me to say that bleeding that um that beta red is trying to go in the middle between the two extremes? That is absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's right. I I agree with you on uh, like legitimately every point you just expressed <laughs> in that whole thing bunch of things you said. Mm -hmm. Like I I all I agree that cyberpunk games don't have to be crunchy and I don't know why there's this mentality that it does. But on the other side, I also agree that that games uh like story games are cool, like narrative games are really cool, mm -hmm. but for some people like myself uh, there we some people like to have things they can play around with, rules that they can adjust, little things they can toy around with to make their character like have a certain edge or a certain thing that they think is cool. That isn't just a narrative thing where they say, "I think this is cool, so I'm going to do this thing." And the game master goes, "Sure, you have every right to do that because this is a narrative game." Yeah, I um, I did a bit. I did a bit of a rant um about a week ago where I where I had said that um. Crun that crunchiness is not the devil that people think it is. Yeah. And my whole po my whole point with that was to uh, was to illustrate that you don't ha you don't have to go that um going because I kept I kept seeing the whole thing of oh the, oh um say say D and D five e is is good because of how because of how simplistic it is and I'm go and I mm. respond and I responded. Simplistic alone is it is is yeah. basically you um reacting to the to um to not li to not liking excessive crunch. Which if you don't like excessive crunch, that's perfect. That's perfectly fine with me. But sure. you can't. Uh, but trying to act like going the opposite route is somehow better by 
some form of magic is something yeah. I don't care for. Right. Like like I said, some of the things that people find really fun about games like Shadowrun and stuff is like how they can do these like cool little granular things because of all of the crunchy all of the little rules that they mm -hmm. have to apply. Right? But they can they can pick one and sort of roll with that to make their character like slightly unique in a way that they've never played before is one of the things that people like about that kind of stuff. When you have a lot of rules to work with, you can have those different things. And that's not everyone's cup of tea. Just like a game where like you don't even have dice and basically you just tell the game master I'm doing a thing and that or there's no game master, you just tell everyone else you're doing a thing and they go, Cool, you're doing that thing. Mm -hmm. That is kind of boring for some people. Where it's like basically we're doing improv acting. We're not actually playing a role playing game. Some people don't enjoy that, right? They like a friend a of mine. Call, a friend of mine calls it a glorified mother. May I? Yeah. Which, um, I'm not sure if that's going to date myself by by making that kind of reference, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have. I had a, uh, a friend who recommended to me the game Amber for whatever reason, the Ar Amber RPG. Or <laughs> he was like really into it, and like I, I explained to him that I have this general like av aversion to like rule no like diceless game systems which this one is mm -hmm. because it often feels like i tell the game master a thing and they say yes or no and if they say no i have to figure out if i can make them say yes and that's like the game what the game is so it's like a i'm gonna do a thing and then the other person goes nah -uh, and then i go uh-huh and we have that kind of back and forth right yeah um and so he, he recommended this game to me and if you haven't heard of it uh, i've, seen I've it, heard of it i've heard is, of amber um, yeah, that, that is literally how the rules break down. It's like you, I was like, it straight up says that's what you, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> what? Um, a few years back, I reviewed Marvel Universe, i.e. Mm. the um, redheaded stepchild of Marvel RPGs. Got it. And that is, that is a diceless system too. And people, people brought up Amber as a bet, as a better diceless. Cause I had pointed out that. For as much free form as it wants to be, it's it it's replacing dice with um, resource management. Sure. And right. I'm not not that, that's not to say there's anything wrong with that, but sure. You need, but I was I was on I was focusing on the fact that you need some sort of mechanic for it to be a game, some right. sort of some sort of some sort of the reason why die why dice became such a um, such a reliable method. Um, aside fr aside from the background of wargaming, is you need to have some sort of me you need to have some sort of measure so that people can understand that there that when doing this action there is a risk that it may not work. Mm -hmm. It's called gamism. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I know that's what it's called, but for whatever reason, the ter the, the a term like gamism always um, left a bad taste in my mouth because sure. mostly because of the ism puts other ideas in right, my head. Right. 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 Yeah. Um but when it comes to now Cyberpunk can take a lot can take a lot of forms. Obviously Shadowrun tries to blend in a bit of fantasy into the matter. Yep. Um, correct. Some magic with your with your cyber. Yeah. Although yeah. Tr although truth be told, I think I think it has too much of a stranglehold on that particular style, but that's just me. Um Yes. The and you something like something like Cyberpunk I w I usually say 2020 be mostly because nobody wants to think about third edition, but yeah. now I got to say red um, no, goes say red, goes a yeah. little bit more contemporary route. You've got um, and you've got other approaches that more more or less lean into lean into the more traditional routes or sometimes integrate the styles of cyberpunk that we'd see that we'd see in uh, Japan. Yeah, correct. Um, where in that paradigm do, do you lean as far as what your primary um, cyberpunk inspirations are? So I kind of pulled from a bunch of different sources, and I list them actually in the book, so people mm -hmm. can see that when they get it. Like there's a, there's a couple of times where I reference the like world, um, but basically I, I pull from my experiences with movies like Blade Runner mm -hmm. and Akira, um, and you can actually feel like like the I mean the name Beta Red is the name of the street drug that allows people to have cybernetic enhancements. Mm -hmm. So like obviously like the whole like pill thing the imagery of like like taking a bunch of drugs and like biker gangs and stuff is mm -hmm. a major part of beta red sort of aesthetic right yeah uh and so like so that so so with blade runner and you've got uh you know you've got you've got places things like shadow run but also like um 
yeah, like Akira and Bright and uh man. I like just just basically you're one, of the few, you're one of the few people I know who actually who actually has seen Bright and and doesn't shit on it. Every for some reason a yeah. lot of people really, really hate that movie and I'm like this is basically sh- this is basically pre yeah. Great Ghost Dance si- um Shadow Run. Yeah. It's sh- it's Shadow Run with without like w- with it being th- like 20 years in the future not s- like 60 years in the future. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the feel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um and so, you know, and and, and then like things like um, you know, like iRobot and stuff. Like I wanted to combine so so the, one of the major factors with Beta Red as far as the world goes. Mm-hmm. So the dice system is a little different. I wanted to make it simplified. Yeah. But one of the things about the world is that, like, there are basically four playable species, and you've got you've got your Akira style psychics, right? Like mm-hmm. people that are just kind of crazy and weird. Uh, you've got clones and stuff, which you find in things like Judge Dredd, right? Because Judge Dredd himself is a clone. Yeah. Um, and then you've got humans, of course. But then you also have like sentient robots that are just people, like a Chappie style robot who just hangs out with gangs and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And so I I wanted to include this idea of like androids and like robots and machines being functional characters because you get sometimes you get them like as backdrop things like it, it, like in cyberpunk 2077 like the video game there are like lots of different ais and stuff that are like backdrop things but not like playable characters right um like altered carbon rpg they say you can play an ai but then there's actually no rules for creating an ai character mm-hmm. like there 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 really aren't like there they say there are but when you read them it's like there's a few flaws like you can't do lit- you can't do anything physical because you don't have any physical stats and it's like this whole thing where it's like well what what is the point of making the ai if i can't like do anything right <laughs> like so like i wanted to make that actually like a thing and i know that my friends that i that i that are programmers and do like computer tech stuff like gravitated toward that idea because it's not something that you usually find in a cyberpunk role playing game. You know, you usually find people that have cybernetic enhancements, but you don't usually have just a straight robot. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, um, I, it's funny you mentioned that. Cause I remember, I remember being on a, um, a, a, a Facebook group about shadow, about shadow run, a more, a more, mm-hmm. A more my style that was that was simply called direct posting because nobody wants to be serious on it. <laughs> they um, gotcha. But somebody had asked about somebody had asked about doing the whole full about doing the whole full cyborg thing like you'd see with say Raiden in Metal Gear Rising, although he's not full cyborg, right. but he's mostly, or a full yeah. cyborg like the like the major in Ghost in the Shell. And the right. problem is both Shadowrun and Cyberpunk can't do it. You can't. You just cannot do it. If you do it, in, if you do it in Shadowrun, you're you're go, you're going with a zero essence character, and you're basically a cyber zombie, and yep. and you automatically have to turn your character over to the game master. Yeah, <laughs> and if you try and do it in um, Cyberpunk, now I'm not sure if this is still the case with um, Red. I seriously de- I seriously doubt this has changed, but. Th- but you'd still have the same result of having to turn your character into an into an NPC, yeah. and in, in that case, they yeah. may as well just make it that. Plus, um, they're a the, cyber psycho because they don't yeah. have enough empathy, right? Yeah. yeah, and I get the I get the intent with with that whole with that whole approach, but given how for a but given how for a whole generation, their first introduction to cyberpunk was not Blade Runner, or yeah. or. Where the, where the whole "Am I a real boy?" Thi- thing um, and the whole loss of humanity is is a part is a part of their theme, but their yeah. introduction was the more was a more transhumanist leaning like Ghost in the Shell, where like the Ghost whole like shells, yeah. yeah, and and pl- and plenty of and even more recent stuff with Altered Carbon, where the whole idea of up of uploading full uploading into full bodies is not. Yeah. Out of, is not out of the ordinary, and something that I've maintained for a long time is that um, nost- is that nostalgia is a sweet poison, and this applies just as much to cyberpunk, because a mm-hmm. lot of people mm-hmm. who are still doing cyberpunk games and still doing cyberpunk campaigns are still stuck in an idea of cyberpunk from the 1980s. Right, right, because that's when the linear genre existed, right? That's when it was big, and that's when it, it still exists, but that's when it started. So that's where it pulls from a lot of the time. Oh yeah, it, def- it definitely pulls. It definitely pulls from that, but yeah, some, but um, but again, again, they're pulling. To. They're pulling primarily from bl- from Blade, 
I can't even say they're pulling from Blade Runner because let's be honest, Blade Runner and Akira both pull from the same idea, and that was the and that was the cyberpunk w- artwork of Mobius. Right. Yeah. They they all kind of pull from like the, like artwork more than like actual stories. Like Neuromancer is a great story, but have you ever seen the Neuromancer movie or comic book? I um I have not re- I. I was I was not aware that either that either were a thing. I've only read the book. That's exactly right. So there is no movie. No mm-hmm. one has ever made a movie out of Neuromancer. But the co- there is a comic book, but it is incredibly difficult to find because it wasn't popular and so they didn't really make a whole lot of them. I wonder if somebody so. scanned it. Or if it's I, on you know, it's supposedly or something like that. It's it's supposedly available online, but it's not on Comicsology. I have attempted to find it there. Um, but it, it's supposedly available online somewhere, and I haven't been able to track that down yet. But the point that I'm making is that, like, like the the Neuromancer is like the foundational story of cyberpunk, but it still it isn't a thing that, unless you've read the book, it didn't get introduced to you in like a consumable manner, like in a movie or anime or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I I can de- I can definitely say for a lot for a lot of people for a lot of people I know the. Um, the their gateway drug for um for cyberpunk was the was um was go was Ghost in the Shell whether it be the original the movie Shell. or the um or the pretty de- or the pretty decent TV series um standalone complex right um yeah i mean for me i would i would also agree like while i had seen the 1995 judge dread movie like mm-hmm. it hadn't really occurred to me that that was cyberpunk and then i saw ghost in the shell and that would have been the first like real instance where I like understood that there was a whole genre like this, yep. and it led to other things like Blade Runner and stuff. But that was because I do I'm that guy who does all the background research who mm-hmm. goes, oh, there's more to this. Let me look into it. But that's just me. Um, and I also have like you know a father who also like my dad is also kind of into the cyberpunk stuff, and so mm-hmm. like he's like, oh yeah, we should watch this movie or that movie or whatever. And so and that was that was only the reason why i saw those movies but i agree with you that my first introduction would also have been considered uh ghost in the Shore. and to, to be quite honest um i've never went, i'm never 100% comfortable using ju- using judge dread as a um as, as a as a as a point of reference because judge dread is a parody and this yeah, this it's it is supposed to be it is ba- it is basically what happens when ju- when um when John Wagner asked, "What if Dirty Harry was legally empowered to pull all the shit he did?" Yeah. What if fascism was the way that we did government? <laughs> yeah. The whole the whole thing is meant is meant to, is meant to be a giant parody, and he and he doubled down on the parody because um, some because some some because he was getting letters from chi- from children that yeah. unironically agreed with with dread, and. Mm-hmm. I'd say I'd say the whole parody thing is the reason why the the um, attempt to do the film with Stallone ended up being a massive failure. Mm-hmm. Although the um, the Carl Urban one is actually really good. It's actually really good. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, but you know it, what they? You know what? Neither of those. Well, well. So the the Stallone one did a better job of involving robots in that movie. Mm-hmm. But like, there's a whole bunch of robots in the Judge Dredd comic books. Oh and yeah, that leads me back to robots in mm-hmm. Cyberpunk. Why yeah. are there not robots? Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I'd say I'd say the reason why you don't why you don't see them is, the, is the fact that the ro- the whole idea of doing a robot is, is is either seen as too far off or or the ho- or again focusing on that whole lo- the whole cyberization and loss of humanity theme, which I've got no problem with, but there's no reason why that should be the be all end all. Right. Um. For sure. Especially since you've got a whole generation that grew up with stuff like Terminator, which oh yeah, I'd hesitate to call cyberpunk, but ever but um every but everybody remembers Arnold and some and some people remember some people remember that um well somebody had the brilliant idea of ma- of making the Terminator ske- skeleton prop made made out of cast iron instead instead of um, fiberglass like it was supposed to be, <laughs> yeah, which is what. Which normally doesn't sound that bad, except you're, except remember they were guerrilla filming, and you've with no with no permits at night, and you've got a prop that requires three people. But now, when it comes to when it comes to the die system for Beta Red, now obviously you're using a D6 system, so 
I will get I will get the bad joke out of the way. How many pounds of D sixes is somebody gonna need? Actually, not that many. <laughs> uh, because I like so my first RPG ever period ever period mm -hmm. uh, was Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. The first RPG that I ever played was actually Shadowrun, and, and so I started off with RPGs rolling whole pounds of D sixes, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And so one of the things when I was thinking about the design for Beta Red was like, I don't want to do that. Um, I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of statistics that get involved. So the dice system, like that I'm using, has a weird statistical breakdown. I even had some. I had a friend who was like really into numbers who crunched all the numbers for me, so that he was like, because he, he wanted to make sure that he built the most optimized character. So he broke down all the numbers for me. And he, he was like, yeah, here's how your statistical breakdown goes. And I was like, cool. You forgot about the exploding ones. And then he was like, gosh, dang it, that throws the entire statistical chain <laughs> off the map. Um, but, uh, but anyway, the so basically, I think the maximum amount of dice that I've ever seen anyone be able to do when they're trying to break my system is something like 12 or 13 dice, which is which is shadow run level. But the average number is going to be something like six or seven dice mm -hmm. for like the, for the big stats that you're really good at. Yeah. Um, and so you're really only going to need like like say like eight d sixes and that's pretty much going to get you everywhere you need to go in beta mm -hmm. red um because the way that the dice system works is that it's just a the the number of dice that you roll is the stat for the skill so all the skills just like just like maximum focus all the skills are linked to a stat mm -hmm. and you're going to roll the set so if you're going to punch somebody you're going to roll the strength set if you're going to shoot somebody you're going to roll the reaction set if you're going to be trying to fix somebody up or repair a computer or something that's a that's an intelligence set like that kind yeah. of thing and that dice pool is the number of dice you roll. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference with Beta Red is that when you want to get a hit, unlike a lot of other systems, they tell you like fours or fives or sixes are hits, you know, or whatever cases. Like that's a success. Uh, and then you do that. In this case, you will your skill level is the number on the die that you need to see. That or below that you need to see to get a hit. So if you have like a skill of two, then when you roll that big that pile of D sixes that you have. A one or a two is a hit, and everything else is a failure. Mm -hmm. And and so that that creates a that creates a statistical breakdown that's really actually fun to kind of play around with when you start like customizing your character. And and um, what I'm curious of, so it, first off, um, it's nice to see more people trying to go trying to go for the aim down approach rather than aim high, which yeah. is which is um very prevalent even uh, even outside of the obvious games mm -hmm. but the other thing is what pr what prompted you to throw in the explosion rule so it was actually after testing the game a bunch of times like the question i like started having so if i wanted to make something like incredibly difficult right like if i wanted to make something uh need six hits uh i was like they statistically based on the statistics alone they're going to need like nine dice and have uh, five as their skill limit. Because the maximum skill limit is five in this game. You keep, there's got to be a failure point on the die. Mm -hmm. So you can only have five in your skills. So I was like, they'll have to have like nine dice at, with five skill to get, you know, six hits. And like it just, it, it led to this point where I was kind of realizing that like the, like the way that, that successes were going to have to break down is I was either going to have to do something like, say tales from the loop or whatever where basically just a success means you did the thing or um figure out a different way to sort of break it down and i i realized that the easiest sort of way to sort of mitigate this problem that i was encountering during the testing was to allow people to reroll once um which which is really great also when you come to damage you know and you roll you're like you go to roll your your damage for something you're like yeah i hit him i got him like really good but then you still roll like a bunch of ones mm -hmm. everybody hates that right i was yeah. like so if i just all of the ones and turn those into like you just re-roll the die regardless right of whatever kind of die roll it is just one explodes and it becomes another you know another die roll um that works out really well especially considering that ones are always hits in this game mm -hmm. and so now what you can have is you can have somebody with a skill level of like four or a stat, a stat of four, and still, and a skill level of like, you know, even one, and still manage to get a couple of hits out of it because they keep rerolling the ones. In fact, yeah. the, I did a play test the other day where we were testing, uh, we just wanted, I changed up some of the flying rules. So we did a test on the flying rules. Mm -hmm. And the, the one character had four dice and he had four in the skill, but he was getting like consistently like four to five hits because he kept rolling ones and rerolling them. 
Oh, it makes sense. And so he was able, he was able to do cool actiony stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, where he's like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do like an aim shot, like through the the hole that I made from the previous shot and the windshield to hit that driver to get him to like hurry out of the way while we try to blast through this like hole. And he was doing like things like that because he could get those extra hits he needed with the ones. So that's that way. It was just a matter of like trying to figure out how to mitigate this like difficulty levels and make it work easier. And that was the, that was the idea I tested and it worked wonderfully. So I stuck with it. And when it comes to, when it comes now, when it comes to that particular, that particular um, setup, Given the given the um, obvious influence that you that you've had with um, Shadowrun, I'm curious mm-hmm. if there was a, if there was ever if there was ever thought of putting something similar to a butt rule like how Shadowrun has glitches. Oh sure. Or was yeah was that something that just didn't work? It uh it it was a thought that crossed my mind, but it kind of doesn't work um, because what I found so what actually happens more often. This is this is the thing, uh, because of this this system of skills, right? Where like basically, if you don't have if you haven't put any skill points into a thing, then you essentially need ones on the die. Mm-hmm. Um, what would end up happening a lot? What ends up happening a lot more often, on average, for especially for beginner characters, is that they get a lot of dice rolls where they get no hits. Where they're trying to do a thing and they get no hits, and so I'm like. If we do like a critical glitch or something, like how does that work? Is there, would we do like you have no hits, but you also have sixes, therefore you fail horrendously? I mean, you already failed. So, how do we do that? And so, in fact, I instituted a different system where if they get no hits, they actually get something called feedback, which they can use later for um, automatic hits, which actually has, has, has problems where people like get a lot of bad rolls. So, I've seen a lot of players will spend like half the game never getting hits never being able to accomplish any actions but then eventually they've built up enough feedback that like they do something epic because they just have the points to just spend mm-hmm. where they go i'm gonna do this thing where i knock out the power for the entire city block i need five hits i'm gonna spend all five of my feedback i don't even need to roll the dice i'm just gonna do it you know and it's done stuff like that it's pretty yeah, cool makes sense makes sense and um, and um when it comes to that obviously we have a we have a mantra here in the temple: "The dice gods show no mercy." Amen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, so so on the because on the flip side, if you do like critical glitches, you also have to do like like critical successes, which mm-hmm. is a thing that like Shadowrun doesn't do. And so it's a weird thing to say like you can fail horrendously, but you can't succeed epically, right? Which that brings me to a question that ties in, into a bit of um game design and GM philosophies. Mm-hmm. What's your stance on fail forward? So I, I, I mean, I think that, w- that it's totally a thing that works. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm great at it. I'm also not saying I'm bad at it, but I think it's, it, it depends on what the situation is. Like I agree with failing forward. I just don't, um, for me, it's not something that I think the, that the rules kind of dictate. It's more like the the players and game masters kind of work out amongst each other. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because I know, like, if a game system... So, like... Uh, okay, so, like, game systems that have these sort of partial successes, partial failure things, they tend to bug me a little bit because sometimes I'm, like... Like, I was playing a game of Genesis where somebody was showing me how to play Genesis, and I was playing it, and we played, like, three sessions or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there was a part where I was, like, I was carrying a guy, and we were climbing uh, the side of a cliff, and, like, I was climbing up the cliff, and he makes, he's, like, make a climbing roll. And I I succeeded, but also failed. I was, like, what does that mean? (laughs) And he's, like, well, well, you tell me, what does that mean? I'm, like... Did I climb the cliff or did I not climb the cliff? He's like, oh, you climbed the cliff, but something happened along the way. I'm like, did I lose my friend? He's like, I don't know. Did you lose your friend? I'm like, I I, I don't know. (laughs) What do you mean? But did I climb the cliff? I was carrying the guy. Mm -hmm. Did I climb the cliff? And that was sort of the the thing where it got into this weird narrative. And that's not exactly failing forward, but but you see where I'm going. Like some things like that tend to work out like as a narrative with people rather Mm -hmm. than having the system tell me that that's how it should work out. Yeah, I can definitely I can definitely get that. It's one it's one of those things that I get a different result every time every time that I ask about that kind of thing. Yeah. Um 
now one of the one of the core die mechanics that's that's brought up with um with the game is saves and i'm cur mm -hmm. i'm curious where um so where saves are typically going to come into play during well play well there's a couple of places where saves are pretty much expressly stated um for example for uh psychics they have to make every time they do like a psychic thing mm -hmm. they're gonna have to make a mind save against the the psychic backlash they get from it so uh in the in beta red it's not just like it's not like magic where you just cast mad like these psychic things mm -hmm. and it's not like um it's it's not like uh that you don't have like a payment for it like basically you have to make a payment for it each time you try to do a psychic thing you're you have to you put pro you put pressure on your body and your mind and so you have to you have to take backlash. So you have to make a mind save. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you like well, and the mind save reduces that damage that you take. And so you're still going to take the damage. Just how much of it do you save? Right? How yep. much do you? you... Uh, the same thing. Like there's another uh, same thing happens with like damage when you take damage. There's a mm -hmm. soak roll, which is basically a save, and that knocks off damage. But you also have, have like body save is expressly stated that when you like start dying, when you like take enough hit points that you're now at zero hit points, and you start bleed out or whatever you have to make body saves not to die right and then and that's when a body save comes in like automatically stated you're going to do body saves here mm -hmm. uh and then you have heart saves uh for like social encounters it straight up says if someone tries to do a social encounter against you like your save is a heart save like there are certain things that are like you do this thing and then because you succeeded at it the person that your target has to make a heart save or else they can't do anything for a couple of turns stuff like that yeah um so these saves are expressly stated in a lot of places and then they have like a more looser description that like a game master or mo the moderators can utilize for narrative purposes. Like, okay, mm -hmm. so you know, a body save also deals with poisons and stuff. So you could if something like like somebody drops a gas grenade into an area and you guys have to make body saves to not choke from it. You know that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, yeah. Beta Red has its own spin on ha on hacking or sec or security or whichever whichever you'd prefer um, calling it in the form of cracking and cracking. Obviously, given the given the tech ba given the tech based motifs within Cyberpunk, everybody's got their own spin on how to on how to do hacking, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm call I'm calling it that for this just for just for the sake of right. my sanity That's and I'm not be, uh, yeah and I'm not paid by the syllable. Um, right. when you when you've what were some of the things that you wanted to do that that you wanted to focus on and wanted to avoid when it came to your take on this kind of pillar? I well, firstly, I wanted to avoid the kinds of of hacking stuff that you find in some tabletop RPGs, where it's like a weird maze of stuff that engages the the one player for like hours on end, while the other players don't really have anything to do during that time. Mm -hmm. um, the classic. Shadowrun third edition problem, the Cyberpunk 2020 problem, um, you know, like these these things where like people get stuck in these hacking moments that are just a, a direct narrative between the player and the game master. So I wanted to mm -hmm. focus on the speed in which those things happened, um, and and then it, it, it like it led to a couple of different ideas, uh, which kind of solidified in the system that we have, which is very much like the actions that you do for combat or the actions you do for flying or the actions you do for psychic stuff where it's basically a thing that you're trying to do mm -hmm. if you try if you manage to hit the target number for that you do it right yeah and and that and sort of that kind of thing so that it could just we could just move along and be like a snappy clip pace where the hacker's like i'm gonna do this thing and then they try mm -hmm. um and then i and then i obviously had to well like i had to, like i had to think about the deeper stuff of like okay cool that's fine for stuff like I'm going to hack that guy's cell phone, I'm going to hack that gun, I'm going to hack that car. But what about things like going into a computer system and trying to navigate that to steal data, which is what mm -hmm. the other games focused on first and built their rules on. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have these like prolonged hacking systems where you're going to do like 10 different things before you've successfully turned off a guy's cyber surprise or something. It, right? it, also, um, can, it also kind of reflects what, um, what hacking was in popular media at the, at the time for those games. Right. Right. Uh, and so, but so I, I, so I had that, I had to focus, I had to do that too. So there is some stuff about that where like, if you, if you get into a system, depending on how you get into it, you could, you know, launch an ice, but I, you know, I spelled it differently, obviously, cause you got to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you, but you essentially launch an ice and then like that, that complicates things for you. But the complicate, the way it complicates things doesn't necessarily 
slow it down like a lot, right? It slows it down a little bit, but it still allows things to be a bit, still a bit more snappy. Mm -hmm. And speaking of combat, since that was since that was brought up, um, some some games up. Some games obviously try and go for a more lethal approach with combat, and some try to go a, a little less so. Um, Shadowrun obviously has the has the um, zigzag zigzag track that is that's had since day one. Um, yeah. How how le how lethal would you say um, Beta Red's combat tends to go for? Uh, I would say it's pretty lethal. Uh... So as it seems to be that my tradition for for game design is to look at like combat in this way that it shouldn't happen super often and if mm -hmm. well, like it it'll happen but when it happens like it should be a thing where you have to think tactically you can't just like stand there in the middle of the road firing guns back and forth until somebody dies right like mm -hmm. it should take it should be something like a sniper will take you down kind of yeah. feel right um just because that that to me then makes it it sort of forces the players to think about like what is the cover around this area? Do, do I have an exit? How do I maneuver myself? Like those kinds of things, which allows them, which, which creates a more dynamic situation. Mm -hmm. So in this game, you have low hit points. Uh, so, you know, you take, and, and like, it, you have like, say, 10, you start with, you have 10 plus whatever your toughness is. So you'll have like, you're going to have 11 to like, say, 16 hit points, right? Uh, and then you have you have things like armor that can sort of mitigate that. And you have a soak number, which is based on like your body and things. And so there's some damage, but like oftentimes two or three successful hits on you will pretty much take you down. So you want to be able to like you know not get hit two or three times in a row. Essentially. Mm -hmm. So it is fairly quick and lethal. Um, but they're they're essentially it, it also relies on the action thing. So like just normal i'm going to point this gun at somebody randomly and just fire and hope for the best that's the easiest thing to do but the more complicated you get where you want to like shoot around a corner or things like that will add more complications and you have to do like a better dice roll essentially mm -hmm. so um but the moral of the story is it's it's fast and quick and deadly and you have low hit points and that's basically how it goes yeah and um there's one other pillar when it comes to when it comes to the mechanics that I'm honestly surprised. I'm, I'm honestly surprised, but also unsurprised, that this isn't tackled more more often or tackled in a way that's not just a glorified skill check, and that yeah. is rules for flying. Yeah. Which you think that when you're dealing with these sprawls where there's t where there's buildings all where there's buildings as far as the eye can see and nobody's seen the ground in centuries, and flying vehicles all, all over the place, you'd think that, um. There would be some rules for there would be some detailed rules for it, but a lot of times it's just okay, roll piloting, and yeah. that's really it. Mm -hmm. But what was 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 the fl was the flying thing some something that you just wanted to add, that you wanted to add from the get go as a means to make sure that not every encounter has to be on the ground stuff. Well, um, so to to. To be honest and fair, uh, the original set of rules for flying was very much like you said before, where it was just like, okay, it's a piling trick. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, so that's how it started. But over time, as I was like developing the system of actions and stuff, like I did for like the other stuff, I was like, man, you know, we gotta we gotta do some flying things. We gotta make sure that like the same kind of system exists for flying. So that the like there are a few skills, if you look, that don't really have this kind of like chart of stuff you do with it. Like mm -hmm repair like it just basically repairs right um but i was like flying can't be one of those there's got to be stuff like skimming and dodging and looping and you know trying to fly between buildings and stuff like that because those things are almost like trope-esque for any kind of sh sh like book show you know movie comic book or whatever that involve flying vehicles and since i decided beta red has flying vehicles as you would think that they would then there's going to I have to be those things where there's going to be the the uh, fifth element taxi driver flying between buildings while cops are chasing him, right? Mm -hmm. And it can't just be make fly roll, make fly roll. It's got to be like okay, take choose which action you want to do, and and then you're going to try to see if you can pull it off, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I will admit, I do yeah. I do like the fact that the list of actions is just one page, um, mm -hmm. since it since it means that somebody could print out that if somebody is dedicated designated as for lack of a better term the wheel man they could just they could just print out that page and attach it to their sheet 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it started with psychics, where I figured out like all the different kinds of psychic abilities I thought should exist in the game, mm-hmm. and then I tried to, for all of the other actiony things, try to go. Okay, well, there are twelve psychic abilities, so there should be between eight and twelve actions for other things, and that's. Yeah. And then by doing that, I actually was like, oh, okay, so this is really only going to be like a page and a half of stuff, mm-hmm. or page, or. So that worked out actually quite well. And because I agree with you, I think it's mm-hmm. easier than than the person who's the driver can just print the fly stuff. The person who's the social, the talker, the face person, they can just print the talky stuff. You know. Mm-hmm. Kind of yeah. Now, one when it comes shifting to combat for a second, because this because I just remembered this. Um, one per, one particular s- subject of debate when it comes to setting up encounters is what I like to call the Nova problem. Are you familiar with the concept of Nova or Nova Inc? Uh, I, I feel like I should be, but I actually am not. Um, basically, basically it's when, it's when somebody tries to save all their abilities for, save all their abilities for this one encounter and then just dump everything on that, on that particular enemy. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Is that something that you've seen happen during playtests or were, or dirt or, um, was it a case where... The system doesn't really allow for that kind of thing, even at high, even at higher levels. Uh, yeah. I mean, I saw someone try to do it with a particular character design where they, they basically could do nothing except like grenade blasts, and they waited until like they fought the big boss guy, and then they were like, "I've got grenades," uh, and that's how they did it. Mm-hmm. Um, it did not work out for them very well because they also took damage from the grenades, and inevitably <laughs> they hurt themselves. Um. But it is it is a it is a thing that could happen. I, I I presume that somebody could try to pull that off with Beta Red. But the 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 game does have like a cap on like your skills and stuff. So at mm-hmm. some point you're just kind of like you you have to sort of develop in other areas. Otherwise you, you're you're not spending the points and you can't spend them on what you want, right? So you're kind of stuck. Which uh, but also the thing about like progression. Progression in mm-hmm. in uh, Beta Red is specifically related to how much money you have. It's not there's no skill points. It's like you get money and then you buy new augmentations, which then up your stats or your skills. All right, I can de- I can definitely make I can definitely make sense out of out of that. Um, yeah. Some and speak speaking of advancement, one of one of the things I obviously noticed is that there is a hit limit. When it comes to huh. saves, was that something huh? that developed during testing? No, that developed sp- specifically on the idea that, like, the, if the game base core mechanic was, if you have a die and you roll it, you have to know what the number on on that die is. Mm-hmm. Uh, then it was a matter of like, okay, well, that means every thing has to have a hit limit, yeah. and. So the save had to have a hit limit. So I just kind of pulled from like other kinds of games, like the sort of the OSR stuff and like early Dungeon Dragons, you know, where it's like, these are your saves for your character. I'm just going to tell them to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, yeah, that'll be easy. I'll just do that. <laughs> so that's what we did for that. And speaking of, speaking of that, what given given the rules light nature of of, of this particular um, game, do you see? Do you see a uh, beta red as some, as something that could support a more a more grid like approach to combat, or do you see it as leaning more theater of the mind? Uh, I mean, it's designed automatically as theater of the mind, but there's mm-hmm. no reason why it couldn't support the grid like yeah. system because it does it 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 basically has like three distances. Like there's technically four, but really it's three. Mm-hmm. Basically, the things that are right on top of you, the things that are not right on top of you, and everything else. Yeah, uh, and that's basically how it goes down, and so like that creates like a that that supports the zone system, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which I know some games like Conan and stuff do. Uh, so they have maps and stuff, but they use like zones. Mm-hmm. Um, a similar kind of thing could happen, and you could easily just switch that up and be like, okay, you know what? We're just going to say that like all of these blocks within like five squares of you are all linear, and then everything outside of five squares would be things that are far and so yeah it could very easily support that kind of system mm-hmm. and yeah. given given the fact that you brought up the osr i'm curious if this could also support um crawl styles of play maybe maybe i think i think that uh it's because it's doesn't have like the mechanics are not super complicated mm-hmm. i think that a person who is creative enough could probably easily pull that off yeah um yeah 
Now, admit, admittedly, it might be it might be a bit tricky to do a hex crawl when you're in the middle of of a metropolis, but I don't think it's impossible. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you could you could pull you could you could do some kind of Necromunda style world, right? Where mm -hmm. like the like the cities, like yeah, sure, there's this big mega city that you that that you're in, but it's also like really dense, and there's like underground, and there's tunnels and stuff. You could easily do something like that for sure. Although, truth be told, I wasn't thinking of Necromunda in that kind of sense. I was thinking of something more like Blame. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a really good manga if you haven't read it. Um, don't watch the anime. <laughs> like, Blame. Oh, but yeah, I was, just, I was just thinking, because because Necromunda is just a, just a game that takes place in a hive city, right? Yeah. And so, like, you could take a dense city and still make it work for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I main I mainly bring up blame because um because like Necr Necromunda is good is good when it comes to doing the whole endless gang warfare ap approach but um some t but if somebody wanted to do a more explore exploratory ap approach I could s I could see taking some notes from Blame even though there's no way in hell I'm letting anybody use the gravity gun from Blame that thing's a l <laughs> that thing's a little bit OP sure um. Now, when it now, um, given given that the main um, the main myth, the main method of advancement is money instead of doing experience, um, what is has there ever been, has there been the temptation from some GMs to lean a little bit into the Monty Hall issue? I don't know actually that the. the there haven't been a lot of playtest EGMs. There's only been like two um, mm -hmm. that have not, that are not. Um, but I'm also not 100% familiar with the Monty Hall issue, so perhaps you could like me just a brief bit. So, I then, um, Monty Hall, Monty Hall is obviously and obviously a reference to the to the host of Let's Make a Deal. Is uh, when yeah. is when a GM is a little bit too generous with rewards. Mm -hmm. Dur for okay. for play, for play whether it whether it be gold whether it be equipment whether it be artifacts um or some equivalent yeah. in other in other genres is basically they're rewarding people too much yeah uh, so fair that that could that could possibly exist and there's actually in the moderator section there's a discussion on like increasing the rewards and stuff mm -hmm. um it's brief real brief but it is there uh it could be a problem um, where where game masters are giving way too much money to people, but that comes to like the question on how they want to run their campaign. Do they want their characters to be the players to be leveling up every game session? Mm -hmm. And if so, are they are they kind of considering the scale of their NPCs and stuff for the particular challenges that exist? Because at some point, the players will eventually get way better than the NPCs you throw at them. Yeah. And so like it's it's recommended, you know, the the jobs should be something like five thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? Instead of like ten thousand or twenty thousand. Because at those levels they can they can level up like every other time. Yeah. But if that is the case, if they do get that much money, you also have things like I, I will I will tell you that like in lots of playtests, people didn't end up like either they didn't complete the objective properly or the it was all it was all set up anyway. So like they were they were given like they were promised five thousand dollars, but it turned out to be like they were they were supposed to be the scapegoats. Like they were supposed to be Ponzi Ponzi's for like some other thing going on. Mm -hmm. So like they like these they're doing a thing, and then all of a sudden all the cops show up and they like have to fight their way out, and then they escape, and then it's like well we're not getting paid anything because we were set up. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah so like I think that yeah it could happen, but I, I think. The, the like the cyberpunkian world itself lends itself to characters being burned more often than they get paid. Mm -hmm. And there was one, there was one other thing when I looked at the equipment, which I'm mm -hmm. glad I'm glad to see a simplified one after the after the um, massive massive walls of of weapons that are all mechanically the all mechanically the same except for some slight tweaks. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're the same. Why do we have ten entries for the same gun? Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you're, I mean, yeah. As a, as a somewhat gut, as a somewhat gun nut who, who makes way too, who makes way too many memes about Taurus sucking, I can understand that mm -hmm. to an extent. But, um, 
that can that can only go so f that can only go so far. Yeah. Especially especially since I especially since in the game in a Cyberpunk game you're you're not going to you're kind of have have the expectation that you're not going to be using the stock weapon as time goes yeah, on. Not, yeah. yeah. Right, but, you're gonna be changing it out. So, but something that I did find interesting, and I'm guessing this was a means of of just keeping the rules light nature, is mm -hmm. the um, usage die that you have. Yeah. Um, how did that? Was that one of those? What? How did that come about? Well, so there there are a few games that use it. Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't come up with the usage die concept. Right, it exists in other games, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm a genius at all. Uh, it exists in other games, and I've encountered it in those games, and I felt that it was a pretty simple way of keeping track of what I had, uh, especially for something that's like a consumable. Now, there's like, like I could have just been like, yeah, you have a die, and each time you use it, just count down, and then when you get to zero, you reload, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I was like, but, but I wanted to do that usage. I wanted to go a little bit more abstract and be like, hey, listen, you might just unload an entire magazine into somebody. Um, so, you know let's just let's just roll that and like i think the very first it was the very first play test we did the uh player that was with me he shot his gun for the first time and then automatically was out of bullets and with the usage die and so we had to be creative about how we dealt with the rest of that particular mm -hmm. encounter um it was it was literally just me and him testing to see if the system worked and we we had to like we did like think how would we solve all this in that situation and it became like an interesting thing to me where i was like that's actually kind of cool because one it simplifies the system of ammo but it also it also creates a randomized effect as to when you run out yeah so you can't like you can't like super stock up and like oh i've got 27 clips or something so i'm never gonna run out you know like that kind of thing i have oh. 80 magazines in my bag so i'm never gonna run out of, of ammo in this case you're never quite sure when you might run out although that does and some, sometimes I, I could also I could also see it being a being a possibility of of um not necessarily running out but say um yeah say there's a jam problem cuz even now mm -hmm. even nowadays get guns can still guns can still jam um and that's that's actually a neat narrative way to handle that that I hadn't thought of before you're absolutely correct you could easily narrate that as like it's not necessarily that you're out of bullets it just it's jammed yeah and yeah. yeah well you can certainly clear a jam you're Trying to clear a jam in the middle uh, in the middle of a firefight isn't exactly the smartest idea in the world. And well, if you need a historical example, look at the look at the old Thompson. I mean, the sole reason that the the sole reason that the Thompson became became such a big thing was be wasn't because of, wasn't because of how reliable it was, it was because it was cheap. One of the rules of yeah. combat is your weapon is made by the lowest bidder, and yep. Thompson submachine guns were notorious for being jam machines. Mm -hmm. Um. But but um. And even and um, if somebody wanted to be really cruel, they could they could probably do they could probably do it that rolling lo rolling low just means that. Oh you um, oh some somebody set somebody set you up and you had and you had a um dump you had a dummy round. Um. Yeah. Because there was there was a there was a bit of a thing where um the where these, def where these defective rounds were dis were uh, distributed. Back back in the day, mm -hmm. and if you tried if you tried to load them in, your gun might um, explode. <laughs> mm -hmm. But one thing that I'm curious about, and, I'm, and this and this may be something that you're planning on addressing, but have you considered how the how this system would handle the use of different types of ammunition? Yeah, so I actually have, um, and I've actually sort of working out that sort of stuff. Because it actually isn't very complicated to sort of work out the different types of ammunition mm -hmm. and the different types of even weapon modifications. Yeah. Um, the only reason why I didn't sort of put them in to the rule book as it currently is is because um, I hadn't I haven't really super tested them. But what I have intended to do is is make that uh, like this is this is in this is a Kickstarter that's just me and it's like super low fund level. Mm -hmm. But if we do get the level and we do start doing stretch goals, I plan on like actually making that a thing where then I'll, I'll actually take the time before we release it and test these weapon modifications and ammo modifications. Because I think that when it breaks down to it, there's basically kind of, there's really only like four kinds of real modifications people might be looking for um, for, their, for their ammunition. And really all it would do 
simplistically would be like adding a damage die, for example, to the damage that the the gun or the weapon does, and but also um, like maybe or or like maybe it adds a weapon a damage die or like adds a uh, skill point like the skill actually gets a little bit easier, you know, whatever mm-hmm. or simplistically it just reduces the target number that they need for the action so like a flechette round for example would make it easier to shoot targets in close range because it would hit like it would spread out and hit more targets right so the mm-hmm. the tn for just a simple blast would be which is two normally would be zero essentially you automatically hit with the with the flechette rounds if they're in the close range that kind of stuff yeah and i yeah um and give, given given some of the heavier some of the heavier stuff with the with the cannons, I could I could yeah. see um I could see a certain person at my table trying to ar- trying to give me a five paragraph argument about why they need why they need to use heat rounds. Right. Exactly. <laughs> oh. And get and and given the fact that we're dealing that we're dealing with a very hot. We're, a very far future um, setting. There's no reason that there aren't crazy types of ammunition or smart or smart ammunition or even even somebody wanting to do, do their own spin on the um, the uh, ZF one's replay feature. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and and I also thought of like laser tech as well, mm-hmm. right? Like how mm-hmm. could laser tech play into this? And so yeah, so I have thought about like the different kinds of, of damage modifications essentially as as it were for um, like the ammo as as like the tagline like ammo modifications. Yeah. And, and how they would work, and it, because there's, it's really simple. The system is really simple. There's a couple of different ways to approach it, and so I figured I would, for ammunition, just be like, those different ways to approach it. Each each one will approach one of those different ways, and that's how you kind of work it out, you know. And when it comes to when it comes to the whole grenades thing, since one of your players decided to decides that um, excessive explosions is just a suggestion. Um, yeah. I'm curious how I'm curious if um if you've if um scatter has ever come has ever come up in discussion. Yeah, so not not in discussion, but I do I did uh, think about it, and I kind of I debated it actually quite heavily for a few days as to whether or not I wanted to include that in the game before I did like a combat test with grenades. Mm-hmm. Um, and the main the main thing I kind of decided was that like. As as long as I did something like where the 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 grenade, like basically I just wanted to simplify it. Like like let's keep it as simple as possible. The grenade goes off, things within near range get hit, which creates a weird situation. And this is actually what ended up happening when I decided to make it just simplified and not do like random scatter patterns or more scatter patterns in general. Mm-hmm. Um, was that like it, it because because the system of distances is really really simple. It's basically like I said, it's it's you, and then the things not you, and then the things that are really far away. Essentially, mm-hmm. um, people were like realizing that if they they have to think about throwing grenades a lot more often because the enemy is near range, but that also means that they are near range to the enemy. So when they throw the grenade, the grenade does lots of damage to the enemy, but also does some damage to them, right? And so it creates a, a different. Thing where they like okay well I, I should probably get behind cover and i should probably do these things and so it just became like an easy thing where it's like everybody that's in it's in near to that particular target is going to get hit with some shrapnel from that grenade um and that it created this 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 it re- this move away from the reliance of using grenades all the time like people stopped using them as often when that became the effect which i can do de- can definitely um i can definitely see that see that happening i'm i just have a bit of a bias in favor of Wildly, un- wildly powerful but ridiculously unsafe weaponry. If you want to blame anything for that, blame the noisy cricket. Yeah, right. Which, and I could, I could easily see, I could easily see, um, see put, see putting up some upgrades that are che- that are cheap, but ha- but have but have some drawbacks. Like somebody setting up a sh- somebody se- somebody getting. Say a shot, say a shotgun that ha- that has more kickback. So you'd have to, you'd have to do say a save in order to make sure you don't get knocked on your ass. Right, exactly. Um, and I, I think, I think, I think some of it is also ju- just. Uh, I grew up in the '90s, obviously, so I grew up with a lot of '90s shooters, which means the mm-hmm. kind of crazy weapons you'd see and those those sort of shooters. 
right and with with that with that um with that kind of thing in mind um when it comes now when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the opposition are you do you plan on do you plan on having a few pages dedicated to just um just in just encounters just um and just different types of grunts b bags and, and the like from diff from different factions or do you ha or do you have a more general approach that you're planning uh so there right now there's one page that has like a whole slew of various uh example dudes that you can pull from mm -hmm. um and they are they're labeled that sort of indicate that they're from gangs or specific organizations or whatever um but like like a like yg uh security drone for example would be like okay so that's like yg corp security drone okay well that i could really just call that whatever that's just the name of it but it has all the stats for that um nbcs are real simple in uh beta red like the whole deal is that they all they all have six dice as their stats that's just what you roll that just roll it for everything but the target number uh is the their, their difficulty is essentially the target number the hit limit for the dice so if you want to make them easier mid-range type you put like two or three so anytime you roll those that about those six dice twos or threes are hits uh mm -hmm. if you want to make them a bit harder then you you know make it like five right and so then like they get a lot of hits mm -hmm. um but if you want to, uh if you want to make them bosses then there's like some rules for like okay give them like an extra uh, action in the combat and maybe give or 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 maybe give them nine dice or both right mm -hmm. um so it's, it's really loosey-goosey on the creation of npcs but i did create I did have a page of just like their stats, just for people to like be able to game masters just go. Okay, I'm gonna just grab like these stats real fast. But I am intending to also add some more iconic uh, NPCs that I didn't think about until recently. Um, I'm doing this sort of promo, or this thing on on Facebook on the Absolute Tabletop where every day I'm posting another like answering another question about Beta Red based on like the world building stuff from a couple of years ago that they mm -hmm. they did on that same group. Um, and it like is is actually causing me to think about things like, I didn't actually include any information about what a psychic response or a psychic retrieval retrieval team is, and those are supposed to be the big scary guys that have like the huge stats, mm -hmm. but there's no information on what that is. So I've actually thought I may need to include a few more pages in the moderator section that explains some of that stuff a little bit better. So there will be some of those more iconic -y types that sh that that the game master will probably want to use from time to time if for no other reason just to be like. In the distance, you see, you know, etc. This iconic thing that everyone goes, "Oh, guys, we should be careful." Like that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, oh, sorry, sorry, no. sorry, I didn't mean didn't mean to cut off. No, I was actually pretty much done. I was just gonna say, but at the core, like it's mm -hmm. legitimately the the NPCs are the discussion on how to use NPCs or how to create them is really really easy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it shouldn't be too difficult. And now, when it now. Given the given all that, how how far how large do you say you're shooting for as far as the as far as the final um, book? Are you shooting for like a hundred pages? Uh, I'm shooting for like seventy as like the largest size to it. It's currently somewhere around the fifty six pages, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and so, like sixty will probably be where it lands, kind of realistically. And then if there's some stretch goals that come into play there might be another few pages that get thrown in there uh i'm not going for 100 pages only because uh it's 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 not like i could but it's it's kind of it's so light that i don't know that it needs to be that big mm -hmm. um and I'm, I'm sort of aiming at the zine quest kind of zine aspect uh and making it a little bit smaller um but I, I guess if it gets large enough through, like if it gets a lot of funding, then maybe I will put it up to 100 pages. But I'm thinking, but I, I like basically I took all the core stuff that I needed to make, mm -hmm. and then was like, okay, now that that's done, what other stuff do I need to include? Okay, some lore and things like that. And so I stretched it out to be about 60 pages. I think is probably where it's going to land, but 70 is kind of where I'm targeting to be the like max size of it, as it were. Yeah, I can, I can, um, that I can definitely get get behind that. Yeah. Um. Plus, it doesn't, it doesn't cost much to print seventy pages of an A five book. It's it's not super expensive, so I could charge like a lower amount to people to buy it from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, now with that said, when can when can we expect the Kickstarter to go live? The Kickstarter will go live on February 9th. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's where it goes live. And then it will end, I think, on the 26th or something. Let me double check my calendar if I ask. The Friday before the end of the month. So right. that would be the 26th, yeah. So the 9th to the 26th is when the Kickstarter will be active and live. That's when people can, you know, back it and get in on it, get their stuff. And then after that, it will, I, barring some crazy thing happening, I intend to fulfill it by the end of the year. Yeah. But. Barring the sky, the sky, the sky falling, or the um, or the Cubs winning the World Series again. Yeah, I mean, so I had a, I had a pretty good mentor, uh, as it were, like working like in a partnership with Mike for Rock Commander Games. I could see the other side, like the distribution side, mm -hmm. that I I honestly had no experience with before Maximum Apocalypse, and like seeing how he handled these things and how quickly he was able to get stuff done because he just went with certain kinds of ideas like okay well, let's do it all in the u.s let's do it all like this kind of thing we were we were able to fulfill it within six months you know? mm -hmm. and i approached beta red with the same mentality of like the project should be at least 99 percent done 90 percent done and tested and stuff and like we weren't really making any major changes to it before we even talk about kickstarter and so like that's why technically beta red was something i came up with three years ago but this is the first time anyone's really hearing about it yeah yeah. Well, I will look forward to see, to seeing how it to seeing how it pans out, and with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come out come onto the show and enjoy the crazy that happens here. <laughs> yeah, and it's been fun. And as as always, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Cool. Cool. And of, and, of course, last but certainly not least, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>